You know, a couple of weeks ago, I heard about uh, a man who was moving into uh, a, an apartment center that was for older people. And when he was uh, filling out the paperwork, he looked across the room and there was a woman over there who was staring at him. And uh, he went ahead and filled out his paperwork, but he was a little nervous. After he finished that, he went out by the pool to make a phone call. And while he was making that phone call, he saw this same woman and she was staring at him. At noon, he went into the dining room to have his lunch. And while he was eating, he looked across the room and that woman was staring at him. And finally, when he finished his lunch, he went over to her and he said, I notice that you keep staring at me. And she said, you look like my fourth husband. <laughs> and he said, oh. Well, he said, how many times you've been married? And she said, three. <laughs> There's a woman who lives in my neighborhood who on Monday, two weeks ago, told me that story. And she said that her preacher had told that story the day before in his Sunday morning sermon. And she thought it was very funny, and I thought it was very funny, and I was glad she shared it. And I said, uh, what was his text? What did he preach from? And she said, oh, I don't know. <laughs> and I said, well, what did he preach about? What was his sermon topic? And she said, I don't remember. And I tell you that to tell you that those of us who preach always have better expectations of what's going to happen than what really does. <laughs> we are always hoping that people will hear what we say and that they will remember what they hear and seldom are either of those things true. I just want you to know that I'm aware of it <laughs> when I come here tonight. You know, in the first letter that Peter wrote, and as you know, there are two of his letters in your Bible. The first letter that he wrote was written to comfort and encourage believers in the midst of their suffering because they were being greatly persecuted. This was an external onslaught. Uh, this was coming from the outside and was persecuting those Christians who were on the inside. The second letter that he wrote, the book of 2 Peter, was written for a different purpose. It was written to combat complacency and even heresy in the church. It was an internal attack. It was something that was happening on the inside of the church. And he speaks during that uh, second letter of holding fast to the non-negotiable facts of the faith. Uh, he talks about growing. He talks about rejecting those that would make light of the faith or that would distort it. Overall, it's somewhat of a homily on Christian growth. All of us are aware of the fact that it is one thing to start well, it's quite another thing to end well. And the thing that Peter is talking about in 2 Peter is, let's be sure that we end well. It, it, that was not a new topic. Jesus Himself had said, if you hold to My teaching, you are really My disciples. Uh, some translations have that, if you continue in My Word, 
you are really my disciples. Discipleship is something that is continuous. It's something that we never stop with. It's something that's called sanctification in some ways. This is Peter's objective in the first chapter of 2 Peter. He reminds us that we are participants in the divine nature. He urges us to make our calling and election sure. He carries this theme all the way to the end of that book of 2 Peter, where in the very last verse of that book, he says, grow, grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You're going to be in this summer series studying verses 3 through 11 in the first chapter of 2 Peter. And so to get an overall feel for that, I want us to read that. If you have your Bible, turn to 2 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to read that. I'll be reading from the uh, New International Version. I don't know exactly when, what you may have there. But the reading will be very similar, regardless of what it is. 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning with verse 3. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these, He has given us His very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, yours may say patience, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, or yours may say brotherly kindness, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This passage lists eight qualities And these eight qualities you will be seeing through various speakers. Eight of the sessions that you'll have this summer are going to deal with each one of those words, each one of those qualities that are there. And the thing that makes this so so very important is that he says, if you do these things, if you do these things, you will never stumble or you will never fall and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It just seems to me that this has to make this an enormously important section of Scripture. If you do these things, you're never going to fall. If you do these things, you're going to go to heaven. That makes this enormously important. Uh, The reason that the series is being called Everything We Need is because of What happens there in the third verse when Peter says His divine power has given us everything we need for a life of godliness. And because that's what these eight Christian graces are all about, it's very important that we give attention to them. Because without these qualities, we really are doomed to disappointment. I mean, we are reduced to a life of frustration, but with them, we have the assurance that we're not going to fail. And we have the assurance that we're going to go to heaven. 
I don't know how you possibly can improve on that. He's given us everything we need. That is a high claim. And it really, the, the, the claims of, of, of the gospel stagger the imagination when you get right down to it. Uh, on the face of them, sometimes they almost seem too good to be true. For instance, when Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. What do you think about that? If you're weary and burdened, come to me, and I'll give you rest. That has to have wonderful appeal. Every single person in this room has been caught up or will be caught up in a real tough task in living. It's not easy. You know what it is to have a pressing schedule. You've been there. You have people in your church who work two jobs to make ends meet. A single mom. And in order to put dresses on her girls, in order to put shirts on her boys, in order to put food on the table, she has to work two jobs. That's tough. Or you have people in your church who are caregivers, responsible 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, caring for somebody who has cancer or Alzheimer's, and it's a really tough job. So when Jesus speaks to us about come to me and I'll give you rest, it has enormous appeal. But for somebody like this, who is a caregiver, all the time, they may almost come to the point of saying, that promise is for somebody else. That just doesn't fit. just doesn't work for me. Or you take that promise that Jesus makes when He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in Me will live even though He dies. We love the sound of that. But this is a promise that we wonder about because, face it, we're scared of death. Maybe you're not. Maybe death doesn't frighten you at all. But it does most people. And uh, the Hebrew writer even writes about those who he says in Hebrews 2, who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Held in slavery by their fear of death. We're afraid of death. And even those of us who believe so strongly in resurrection and in a better life to come, will do anything we can down to spending our very last dollar to live a little longer. You heard the word cryonics? You know the word cryonics at all? Uh, we don't hear much about it. Not too much anymore especially, but back in 1964, Robert Ettinger published a book called The Prospect of Immortality. And in that book, he detailed his plan for prolonging life by freezing the body. In other words, when a person was faced with some life-threatening disease or some life-threatening problem of some kind, he was just saying, okay, what we'll do is freeze the body. We'll freeze that body. And then, when the time comes later on, years down the trail, 
and they find a solution to that, they find a cure for that, we'll unfreeze that body and apply the cure. And then that person can go on living. Well, what they did was take people and they would put them in this glycerin-based solution and cool it by dry ice and they'd get that body down to a temperature of somewhere around minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And then they would lower that body into liquid nitrogen until the body finally reached 300, minus 320 degrees Fahrenheit. And then what you do is just wait until there's a cure for whatever took them out. And you apply the cure. And they go on living. Now, that was in 1964. Nobody's been unfrozen yet. <laughs> and even those who believed in that thing have quite frankly admitted that they don't know exactly how to do that unfreezing. And still... Lots of people paid over $120,000 to apply the cure. Immortality has always been a dream. But the promise of it is not taken very seriously except by people like you. And when Jesus makes the promise, we believe it. Uh... There's another promise. You come across this impressive promise in the passage that we have here at hand. And it says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a life of godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us through His own glory and goodness. Now that throbs with promise. And He has said, here it is. If you want it, here it is. This is the promise, and here's how you have it. And how you have it to the full. But the Scriptures are insistent that this is found in only one place. Only one place. It's found in Jesus, and it's found in no other place. John was adamant about that. Remember in 1 John chapter 5, he said, This is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life, and he who does not have the Son does not have life. So the message from all of that is very clear. That this is an important thing to have, but belief is hard to come by. And it's a very hard thing to get people to believe that. One of the main problems that I think we have is not in understanding the message. We understand the message. It's in believing the message. It's in really believing the message. That's the difficult thing. Because we become a little skeptical or a lot of people do, become skeptical about these wonderful promises. And the reason for that is really quite clear. There are so many things that we think are necessary to making life a happy existence. And if we don't have them, then how can these promises be true? There are some things that are lacking maybe in our lives that we think are are essential to happen is that list is almost an endless one and it's different for different people. But we think that there are certain things that are essential to happiness. Good family. Good health. Good job. Good house. Good car. Good bank balance. I read years ago, and I do not recall the author, but I read years ago where someone said that we seek happiness in one of four things or in a combination of those four things. And he started all of those with a P. Possessions, popularity, 
pleasure, power. Possessions, popularity, pleasure, power. And he said we seek happiness in one of those or in a combination of those. And when you begin looking around, you know that there are an awful lot of people that don't have those. Maybe not even one of them. I really doubted that when I read it. I thought, that can't be right. There's got to be more than that. And uh, there may be. And uh, I'll leave that for your own study. But the more I've looked at it, the more I think, boy, that guy was <laughs> pretty much on target. You know, I think our pessimism likely arises from a couple of sources. One of those is that we haven't really understood what makes life worthwhile. And the other is that sometimes we've been grossly mistaken about what that life is that Jesus offers. What is it? Looking at the first of those, what is it that makes life worthwhile? Because the good life isn't everything that wears the name. Uh, you know, over there in Romans chapter 1, I hate to get on Ken Stegall's territory here. I told uh, Cleo when he found out that, when I found out that Ken was going to be speaking on this series, I said, I don't know how in the world he's going to get the first eight chapters of Roman in on that topic, but he'll find a way. <laughs> and I'm glad, he, I'm glad that, he, that he does. But sometimes we have just misunderstood what it is that makes life worth. And, and so you get over there in, in, into that uh, chapter in Romans, the first chapter in Romans, and you find out that these people were madly following pleasure. Madly following pleasure. There was no restraint. There was no self-discipline. They were doing whatever they pleased. They were doing their own thing and nobody was going to tell them that they couldn't do it. And they thought they were really living. And they became so depraved that there's that frightening statement there that God gave them up. God gave them up. Meaning, according to commentators, one of a couple of things, either they gave them up to do whatever they wanted to do, or He gave up on them. And I lean strongly toward the first one because I don't believe He ever gives up on us. But sometimes He gives up People to do whatever they want to do. Okay, that's what you're going to do. Have it your way. Have it your way. And so, Peter comes along here and he gives us this promise from the Lord that he has given us everything we need for life and godliness. But how does he say he does that? Through the knowledge of him who has called us through the knowledge of Him who has called us. There isn't any other manual other than the Bible that's going to tell you how you do these things that He's talking about here. It's only that book that's going to tell you what's true and what's not. And what's worthwhile and what isn't what's permanent and what isn't. And until those things are properly aligned, there isn't any possible way for us to have this fullness of life that he's talking about. Now, I said that there are a couple of reasons that uh, we are skeptical about this. And another is that we are so mistaken at times about the life that Jesus offers. What does he offer? What does he offer? A lot of 
misinterpretation and misrepresentation regarding Jesus' offer of life. Uh, back years and years ago, Jesus' words were usually interpreted in rather vague and nebulous terms. Uh, everything about His offer had spiritual overtones, and it was insisted by many people that it had nothing whatever to do with this physical life. Nothing at all to do with this physical life. Now, pendulums tend to swing, don't they? Pendulum did swing. It swung real big. And it wasn't just Dale Carnegie and Norman Vincent Peale. Many went to the opposite extreme reading into Jesus' offer the promise of economic gain, social equality, various things, but it had to do with this life. All of it had to do with this life. You do these things, and you're going to have it made. Both of those views are extreme and fractional and wrong. Christ confronts and speaks with relevance to everybody. Rich, poor. He is vitally concerned about those who are hungry and ill-clothed. Matthew 25. All you have to do is look at his judgment scene there and you can see that he's concerned about that. He is also equally concerned about somebody who is a slave to his or her wealth. Neither of those things works. The message is the same for all. It's about obedience. It's about the meaning of the life that he offers. What distinguishes life from Christ? with Christ as opposed to life without Him. There are a lot of things. It's a long list. And that's uh, some of what will be covered during uh, the other lessons that are going to come in this particular series. Uh, I'll just briefly tell you about three or four of those things that I, that I can see that... Uh, he does offer us. And one of those things is that He offers the ultimate triumph of good. He promises that. Good is going to ultimately triumph. It's going to ultimately win. And sometimes we kind of wonder about that when we look at what uh, is happening because uh, we've been taught, most of us from childhood, that virtue and honesty and purity... Such things are going to win out in the end. Read the newspaper tomorrow. It doesn't seem like it, does it? Not every Bernie Ma, uh, Moyhoff gets, gets caught. Uh, not every Alan Stanford gets caught. There are thousands and thousands of scoundrels out there that are doing bad things, and you say crime doesn't pay, and it kind of looks like it does sometimes. But the Gospel sees it differently. The Gospel sees it that evil is not going to win. And I get pretty concerned about the pessimism of Christians. We have so much going for us. So much going for us. And one of those things is that in the end, we win. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess to God. Everyone will give account of himself to God. That's the promise of Romans 14. And so when we get our feet firmly planted in that, we've got a win situation. The other thing is that it goes on beyond that initial win, we have the hope of a future life. The life in Christ is not one of despair. It's one of hope. It's one of promise. And Paul talks about that over and over again. So that's the life that we have in Christ. And uh, 
the other thing that I would mention, and then I'll close this, but the other thing I'd mention is that it also gives us the courage to face the present life. Whatever that may be. Gives us the courage to face it. Life has its troubles. There are difficulties. There are disappointments. There are hardships. There are heartaches. And you have felt them. Or if you haven't, you will if you live long enough. They're there. Those troubles are there. And they hurt. And they're inescapable. And no one is exempt. And I'll tell you what, Jesus was straight up with us about that. He was straight up with us about that. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. Not you may. You will. In this world, He said, you will have trouble. But He gives us the courage to fight through those tough times. Uh, You know, when you come to that list of things that that Paul talks about, that he faced uh, over in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. It staggers the imagination at what that man went through. It's just almost unbelievable at what he was able to go through. And yet, he spoke about being content, whatever the circumstances might be. That is such an incredible thing to me that uh, what he said was not a stoical resignation to the uncertainties of life. It was an expression of confidence and courage to face what came. He said, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. And I want to tell you something. Contentment is something you've got to learn. You don't have to learn to be unhappy and to cry and to throw a fit. You're born with that. Every child is born with that. They know how to cry. They know how to throw a fit. But if you're going to be content, you're going to have to learn it. Some people never do. And it's an unfortunate thing that it happens that way. He gives us everything we need. And I hope that uh, during these coming weeks that you'll have an opportunity to listen to these speakers as they come and as they unfold in a bigger way those eight qualities that uh, you find in this particular passage. God bless you and thank you for letting me come, Cleo. Appreciate it very much. And someone is going to come and lead us in our closing prayer. Let's stand please for that.